Welcome to Sectors Up Close, I'm Thomas Warner. Today we're discussing what a resounding win for Donald Trump means for European stocks with Russ Mould, Investment Director at AJ Bell. Victory for the Republicans set the good times well and truly rolling on Wall Street last week. The S&P 500 hit consecutive record highs and it still looks to be climbing. But the reaction in Europe was far more muted. The stock 600 is virtually flat on the week, spooked by the prospect of US trade tariffs that could arrive as soon as January. European exporters were already struggling with slackening demand from China. So is the outlook for European stocks as gloomy as it sounds? Well, let's ask AJ Bell's Russ Mould now. Russ, firstly, thank you very much thank indeed you, for joining it's us. A pleasure. It's great to have you here. First question for you. Given all of the potential problems that uh, European equities are facing, would a European investor be wise just to give the European market a swerve completely? I can understand why people would be concerned. Chinese slowdown, Trump tariffs, German economy going nowhere fast, France riven by political problems and, and strikes. That said, the Euro next 100 reached an all-time high in the spring. The DAX in Germany is virtually there. The CAC has only lost a few percentage points from its all-time high. And Italy and Spain are at their highest since 2008 when they're on the way down. So maybe some investors out there are applying the old John Templeton maxim. I don't want to know whether things are good. I'd like to know where things are miserable because that's where things might be cheap. And so maybe that's what some contrarian investors are thinking, maybe. But how on earth can you be looking at the landscape as it stands here today with all of those problems that you just identified and be thinking that there are any real tailwinds coming? Strong dollar helps some of the ex some earners if they're still able to keep their American revenues. ECB is cutting interest rates. And again, you do have valuation on your side. Expectations in some cases are very low. And valuations are quite low. I know European financials have been on a very good run, but they're still very cheap in many cases relative to book value, for example. And if the European Central Bank maybe doesn't go quite as deep as some people think, rates a little bit higher, helps net interest margins. There are still things that can happen. It doesn't take an awful lot of imagination to see them. Well, let's accept then that there is some potential upside coming. You've got to accept, though, as well with that, that some sectors are looking so green around the gills that they might actually just be poor investments. And I'm talking about luxuries, for example. Again, that's an interesting one because the, the starting point and the expectation levels were so high. They'd done phenomenally well all the way through. COVID, lockdown, assumed to be sort of growth stocks par excellence. And then lo and behold, you've had a little bit of a wobble. The expectations couldn't be met and the share prices have been hammered because the, the, the starting point was so high. Again, with some of the valuations, expectations... You know, people haven't recovered many ways from 2007 to 9 as far as European financials are concerned. So valuations are still very lowly. So it's a matter of where you're starting from. Understood. So where are the bright spots as you see them? We've seen defence go through the roof probably ever since the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, we know where the bad spots are. You've mentioned luxury. I know green and renewables, again, perform brilliantly. Valuations got high. Expectations got high. President-elect Trump gets in. Big trouble. So you can, you, can, you can put that all together. Tech is a little bit more varied. ASML, fantastic company, could be the meat in the sandwich between America and China. And again, just a lofty valuation issue there. So maybe what you're looking at is, again, where people just don't want to go. Financials will be one. Consumer discretionary might be another potentially, just because, again, lots of people have just given up. Let's zoom out from equities now. There are challenges you know, surmountable as they may be. Do you expect to see any kind of concerted effort from actual European governments to try and deal with some of the volatility that is likely to be coming down the pike? Well, I think at the moment they're trying to, you know, they're looking to the European Central Bank to do quite a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of monetary stimulus. Germany does have room for fiscal stimulus. Now, at the moment, I don't think we have a German government, do we, I think? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll may there be a, a snap election and a speedy resolution. But if Germany wants to go down the fiscal stimulus route, it has more scope than, say... You could argue the UK or France do, for example. Spain seems to be benefiting from a bit of a tourist boom and a lot of self-help that it put through 15 years ago. Italy, the same. And I know people talk about Germany being the sick man of Europe. I started off as an equity analyst in 1991, <clears throat> and very quickly Germany was described as the sick man of Europe. And then there came the Agenda 2010 programme. So if anything, you almost need a bit of a crisis to shake things up, maybe again, therefore, back to the Templeton point, look for where things are darkest, because that's where they have to get better or there's real trouble ahead. Well, this crisis could represent an opportunity for those people here in the UK that think that actually now's the time for a little bit of European integration, if you know what I mean. So Keir Starmer has been in Paris today. He's the first prime minister since Churchill to spend Remembrance Day in France. Mm -hmm. Do you think that he might see this as an opportunity to start moving the UK closer to Europe? 
I think in some ways, yes. I think formally, I think politically that would be very, very difficult. There was a vote. The British electorate had their say. And a lot of, you know, very staunchly Labour supporting communities, particularly in the north of England, have put down, you know, immigration as one of their biggest issues. And that does potentially feed into the Brexit vote. So I think you'll tread very, very carefully on a formal basis. But I'm sure from a trade basis, at a political and a defence basis, it's very much what I'll be looking to achieve, I'm sure, yes. Just finally, Russ, the US has been on an unbelievable run. Will it continue? Gosh. Well, here's a, here's a stat for you. So if you look at presidency since 1954 and Truman, the three best performing presidencies in terms of the S&P 500 are Clinton, one, Obama, one, Reagan, two. America was coming out of a recession. Stocks had done badly. Valuations were low. The four worst performing presidencies were um, George W. Bush both times, Nixon, Ford and Carter. Then there was an unexpected shock, inflation or recession. And with the exception of Carter, stocks had done well going into that, so valuations were high, which do you think we're closest to now? Uh, we'll leave that for the viewers at home to decide, Russ. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed for your time today. And that is your roundup of what the new presidency means for European stocks. I'm Thomas Warner, and this is Reuters.